All right, well, let's kick it off. Thank you all for coming here today. My name is Becky McKinnell. I'm the founder and CEO of IBEC Creative. And our whole mission at IBEC is to help businesses and the people behind them thrive online, whether it's with websites or with digital marketing or social media or digital advertising. We are making sure that we provide the most value for our clients. And today we have a sold out webinar. It's been amazing to see this amount of responses come in for the topic of AI. And it's definitely been something that we've been talking a lot about at IBEC. And our goal for today's meeting is to be able to educate you on what we're doing at IBEC to embrace AI and give you some tools that you can use for your 2024 marketing plan that include AI so that you can work faster and smarter. So for our agenda today, I'll be talking first about how IBEC has embraced AI and how we've led our team to incorporate it into our daily values at IBEC. So Raina Winters, our senior developer, will be sharing some guidelines and best practices on using AI. Then Jake Dombeck, our digital marketer, is going to be sharing some examples with ChatGPT that you can use for your 2024 marketing plan. And following that, Sean Brousseau, our lead developer, is going to be giving you a real-world approach of what we've done for a client. And then we'll have some Q&A that we welcome you to participate in. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, we encourage you to use the chat feature on Zoom, and then we'll also open it up for questions at the end. So a little bit about IBEC. As we mentioned, we are helping companies, whether it's with websites or social media or digital advertising, so that they can grow their business digitally. In the past two years, we've become a certified B Corporation, which means that we have achieved the highest social and environmental standards for our business. And a big part of that is giving back to the community. So we wanted to do this free webinar today so that we can impart our knowledge and help other people become more educated about how they can have better marketing plans and grow their business in the next year. One of our core values at IBEC is embrace the unknown. And we've had this core value for a while. It embodies the spirit of adventure that we need as marketers and technologists to not run away from things that are scary and be able to take risks. Now, back in February and March, I'm sure you all remember the big doomsday scrolling around AI and how many jobs it was going to eliminate. And it can get scary sometimes when we have issues with new technology that's coming that's threatening us. But what we recommend is instead of running away from it, run towards it and embrace the unknown. So some best practices for leading your company. I think it's really important to start out with this as a foundation when you're talking about AI at your company is first to find your AI enthusiasts. Find those that are excited about experimenting with AI. Find the people that are already using it and gather that group of AI users. Then you want to make sure that you establish your communication channels, whether it's with, um, like, for example, at IBAC, we use Slack as a way to chat with each other. So we have a specific AI channel set up to share information. Or if you have shared Google Docs or Teams Docs, where you can document the tools that you've been using so that everyone in your company has access to what you're learning about with AI, and then develop a meeting cadence for when you're continuing to have these conversations. So in our case with our AI team, we meet once a month. And then at our staff meeting, which is also once a month, we report back on what we're learning and what we're testing with AI. And even if you have your AI committee, you wanna make sure that you're making what you're learning accessible to the whole company. There is a case to be made for every single job description in your company about using AI to make their job more efficient. And lastly, you wanna create your AI principles. So just like your core values at your company, you wanna create the guidelines for your company that when you're in this unknown situation and you're not sure what to do, what are you gonna fall back to as a company that's gonna guide you on making your decision about what to do? So for example, at IBAC, we came up with seven different AI principles. The first one is to embrace being human. So we know that we got to where we are today as a company because we have put our hearts into our work, we've found purpose in our work, 
and we have real strong relationships with our clients. And that's something that we don't want to let go of even when we're using AI. We want to embrace our core values. So making sure that whatever we're doing with AI, it rings true with our other core values at IBEC, like embracing teamwork, embracing creativity, embracing purpose. We want to make sure that we're creating value for clients. Many of our clients hire us and they pay us by the hour. So the more that we're able to do, the more efficient that we're able to be, we can create more value for our clients. We want to make sure that we don't compromise our standards. IBEX is an award-winning agency, and we don't want AI's work to be good enough. We want it to help kickstart our work, but then bring our creativity to the best standards so that we can maintain our standards of excellence. We want to be thoughtful with AI. We have peer reviews with everything that goes out so that nobody's off operating in a silo and we're all collaborating. We wanna make sure that we're staying current. So creating the, the culture of sharing information, sharing news and trying new things with the whole company so that we can continue to get better and smarter with AI. And lastly, we wanna imagine AI is gonna solve problems that we don't know need to be solved or we don't even know what the solution might be. So we have to let our brains free and be creative and think about all of the cool ways that AI can be incorporated into our work lives. So moving on, I'm gonna pass it over to Raina Winters, our senior developer, and they're gonna be talking more about best practices for your AI journey. Um, so I'm going to be taking you through um, getting started with AI. Um, uh, I am a senior developer here at IBEC, um, and uh, I joined the team uh, about five years ago, and I have a big passion for making sure that AI is being um, managed ethically. Um, so what I wanted to go through are some general guidelines for how to make sure you're getting the most out of AI and not falling into any, any common pitfalls. Um, so the first thing I recommend is always look for the privacy policy. Um, this is kind of a no-brainer, um, but it is an easy one to overlook. Um, you know, a lot of the times I think we get into a habit of skipping over a privacy policy, not reading a terms of service, and especially in sort of this emerging industry, um, there are um, not as many regulations, not as many, um, you know, common, uh, common checking um, of one another's work. Um, so definitely being able to read through a privacy policy um, first and foremost, but at the very least, look and make sure that one is being presented to you as available. Um, in checking through all the various AI tools that we have internally, we have noticed a trend of, um, you know, the tools and the apps that um, don't present the privacy policy first and foremost often have more suspect items in that if and when we are able to find that policy. So that's just a key for you to look for if it's not being presented to you right away. Um, that could be a red flag that this is not something that that you wanna put your data into. Um, guideline number two um, is always avoid entering any confidential information into an AI tool or algorithm. Um, so an example of confidential information would be a company report, um, sales figures, um, things of that nature. All AI is recording the content that you enter into um, their system. And so even though sometimes it seems like you're just working with a program and that data is still quote unquote yours, um, you are effectively sharing it with the person who made the tool and potentially depending on how the AI works, all the other people who are also using that tool. Um, guideline number three is along um, a similar vein as guideline number two, avoid entering personal information. Um, this is um, potentially a, a bigger red flag for companies that you know work with banking, work with insurance, where there's a big security concern around personal information in general. 
Um, but personal information can look like an individual's name, their signature, their address, their phone number, their date of birth, other things like that. Um, if this is something that is important in your industry, it's likely you already have a security team. And um, if they haven't already put out um, terms for how you should be interacting with AI in regards to personal information, um, then they should be doing it soon. Um, look for that, ask for that if it's not readily available to you um, and make sure that you are being mindful of all the ways that this data could um, sort of leak out from something that might seem innocuous. Um, and um, item number four is to come up with your internal guidelines. So with different AI tools, um, and we'll go a little bit in, more into this on the next slide, with different AI tools, um, there are different um, places they source their information from. There are different ways that you can use that AI data. And it's important to set uh, a basis for what you are comfortable with, what your company is comfortable with um, in regards to how you're gonna use these tools. Um, and it's important to do that before you get started. Um, because when you start, you know, learning about all these different tools, all these different systems, you're going to want to um, be able to proceed with confidence. You know, it's a bit of an exploratory, you know, time right now. And so having those baselines are going to be really helpful to you to um, move through that confidently. Um, so moving on, um, we uh, recommend just to get started is um, using AI to differentiate your message. Um, and what I mean by that is an AI is functionally an algorithm of common data. Um, and all it knows how to do, all an AI is gonna know how to do is return data that it has been trained on, um, also known as data that already exists. Um, this means that whatever is um, you know, fed into that system, is going to bias the system um, and is going to be familiar to the system. Um, and what I mean by that, there's two ways to take, you know, biased information. The first way is, you know, to take that as, you know, um, social biases that could be inherent in, in uh, your data. For example, if you are feeding example resumes into an AI to train it on the kind of ideal candidate you want for your system, um, if the resumes you have are coming from a biased system where you are, for example, hiring more men than women just because of human biases, um, then your AI will be trained on that same bias. It is not going to remove the bias from the system. It is going to compound it in the system. Um, and you'll want to keep in mind, um, you know, tying right into that, what is the training data that is being used for the AI? Um, that's going to be really important for um, any setup so that you know what you can trust from the system and what you need to fact check yourself, what you need to apply a little critical thinking towards. Um, and since you want to you know, use AI as a, as a baseline to differentiate your message, you can always ask the AI to build out something and then just do the opposite of what it says or use that as a launching point for doing something it doesn't suggest. Um, that can be a really useful way to, you know, come up with a uh, campaign that is different than what all your competitors are doing. So that, you know, whatever the AI has been trained on, um, that's what's already out there. That's what's already existing. You can do something new and unique based on having something out there that has compiled what is already existing for you. Um, so those are really simple tips and tricks and some um, basic guidelines to get started. I'm going to toss it over to Jake, um, and he'll be able to get us a little bit deeper into prompt engineering. Thanks, Reina. Wow, it is great to see so many smiling human faces today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's an honor to talk to you about prompt engineering, something that we're all dipping our toes into as we experiment with the various number of AI tools that are blossoming in 2023 and going to be exploding in 2024. Um, but today specifically, I'm going to be talking about prompt engineering and tactics that you can use specifically for chat GPT. Um, to start off, just what is prompt engineering? It simply put is the process of crafting and refining a query or instruction 
that you then input into an AI tool to get the desired output. Um, so before we kind of dive into more about prompt engineering, I wanted to take you guys through a brief overview of chatbot technology and kind of the history of where we started and where we are today. Um, the first example I wanted to call out was Eliza, which was created in 1964. This is widely recognized as the first example of a chatbot ever created. Um, it used a pattern matching and a substitution methodology to mimic human conversation. So it was able to recognize words and phrases and then pull from predetermined responses and give the illusion of a conversation, but it wasn't actually able to do more natural language processing and understand more complex sentences. It was really just pulling from predetermined responses, but it gave a really cool kind of first introduction into chatbots and what they could potentially be capable of. Um, moving on to the next example, Alice in 1995, which stands for the Artificial Linguistic Internet Computer Entity. Um, a fun fact about Alice is this actually inspired the movie Her, which is where a man falls in love with his computer program. Um, so I say that because Alice was actually one of the first um, very capable models um, that was introduced and it used much more natural language processing, allowing for way more sophisticated conversation. You can actually go play with it to this day. Um, and it actually, one of the revolutionary parts of Alice was that it was the first open source model. So it allowed for developers across the world to use the Alice framework and to integrate that into their own chatbots. And to this day, it's still used in certain chatbot frameworks and it's been kind of built upon throughout the years. Um, so a really cool introduction. And it's kind of crazy to think that that was in 1995. Um, the next example is Siri in 2010, which some would say it's an intelligent personal assistant. Um, others might disagree, but no matter your stance on Siri, it was a first mainstream integration of a natural language user interface um, chatbot. So you can talk to it, you can tell it to do things. It may or may not do them, but in theory, it was one of the first um, mainstream chatbots that was right on your phone, very easily accessible, everyone had access to, had an iPhone. And it paved the way for similar tools like Google Assistant, Microsoft Cortana, and Amazon Alexa, which have become incredibly widespread in many people's homes and is utilized throughout many people's lives. Um, and that brings us to 2022 when we had the introduction of ChatGPT, and this really stirred up the chatbot world. And some would argue that it's not necessarily just a chatbot, it is more of an operating system and a a program to be used in other ways. Um, but this really, with the introduction of large language models and GPTs, which are generative pre-trained transformers, they allow for much more deep natural language processing. And the GP, chat GPT specifically is changed, is trained on a huge amount of data and able to instantaneously pull from this data and create very informative and effective responses, as we all know. Um, and even just since this launch in November of 2022, we've seen a lot of advances on the image generation side and with the introduction of GPT-4, it's only gotten better throughout 2022 and 2023, which is really exciting for 2024. How can we use this going forward in our marketing plans and how are prompts gonna help me get there? Um, I like to think of prompts as steering our vehicle. So they really help us steer the model to where we want to go. Um, the model itself may change, may be driving a different vehicle down the road. The GPT model will change. Um, but the principles behind how you steer and how you prompt will remain the same. Um, so a lot of these may seem like simple things, but in practice, they're actually harder to execute. Um, the first principle that I would call out is just clarity is king. Um, you, it's really important to avoid overly complex and ambiguous language, um, avoid any industry jargon if possible. And if you do use jargon or slang, make sure you define it clearly within your prompt. Um, the next um, thing that I would call out is just being concise. 
a lot of us are tempted to kind of dump a bunch of our data into our prompt and kind of hope that ChatGPT is going to know what's important and pull the stuff out from that. But it's actually much more effective to chisel that down into very concise details that you're actually interested in um, getting an output for. Um, so don't overload your prompt with tons of words, although the models are getting better and better. So it's not necessarily a bad thing or it won't be as bad in the future, but right now it's important to kind of keep your prompts clear and concise. And the most important thing when approaching a prompt is to be goal oriented. Um, make sure you have a clearly defined goal. What do you want to achieve with this prompt? What are you looking to generate? Um, most of these applications that I'm going to be talking about are related to copywriting and kind of content generation purposes and how can you refine your marketing plan strategy, both from the copy standpoint and also the strategy strategy standpoint. Um, so keeping these things in mind, clarity, being concise and being goal oriented um, are really gonna help you steer your prompts in the right direction. Uh, moving on to some examples, you can kind of see the worst to better flow here. So a less effective prompt would be saying, how do I add numbers in Excel? A better and more effective prompt would be, how do I add up a row of dollar amounts in Excel? I want to do this automatically for a whole sheet of rows with all the totals ending up on the right in the column called total. So as you can see, much more precise, much more clear, very goal oriented and specific. Um, and that is a process that should be undertaken for every prompt that you use. Um, and you can kind of read through here quickly and we'll share these with you after, but examples of more precise, more specific and goal oriented prompts that help you steer in the right direction. Um, moving on to some tactics for effective results. The first one, if you're not using this, start immediately because it works super well. It's called the act as hack. So basically you're encouraging chat, B chat GPT to take on a certain persona or personality. So starting your prompt with act as a digital marketing expert or act as a creative copywriter and then inputting the rest of your prompt after that helps to immediately steer the model in the direction you wanna go and gives it a kind of baseline data set to pull from, which is really helpful. Um, the next example that I would encourage the use of is using example text. So this could be using a paragraph with a specific tone that you wanna emulate or part of your brand identity that you're really looking to pull throughout a whole strategy. Um, so using delimiters, so specific demarcations in your prompt help to specify exactly what you want ChatGPT to pull from and are really helpful in replicating certain tones and styles um, in your prompts. The next one that I like to do a lot is asking ChatGPT what it needs. So most of us kind of use the use the tool as an input output um, scenario and don't necessarily engage in conversation as much, which I find to really generate optimal results. So if I'm approaching writing a marketing strategy, I would first ask, what do you need to know to create the optimal result for this specific strategy that I'm working on? So engaging with it by asking questions first, and it will tell you exactly what it needs and ask you the information that it needs to generate the best output. So I highly encourage asking questions to ChatGPT. And the final tactic that I would recommend is utilizing a step-by-step -step approach. So really breaking up your complex tasks into simpler subtasks. So if you are attempting to write a marketing plan, um, maybe, you generate an, a nice solid outline for your marketing plan using ChatGPT, but then you wanna kind of break that down into each section. So for my social strategy, I'm gonna then ask a specific follow-up question about my social strategy. Um, so making sure that you don't ask too much too soon and all the sections of your marketing plan that should be broken up and really specific prompts. Um, I find that to be a really useful approach and it's easy for the model to get confused when you feed it a bunch of information all at once and it yields much better results when you're able to section it off into simpler tasks.
moving on. So just some specific um, prompt recommendations for marketing plan writing specifically. I think it's really important to first specify your industry and market um, as we do as marketers. We all love to do this, <laughs> but it's important to let the model know what we're looking for. And this helps us um, really steer the output of our of our plan in the right direction. Um, you can also engage engage this question in a more conversational way, um, which is really helpful as well. And then the next thing would be to find, define your target audience. Um, I like to just kind of copy and paste a customer persona in, and that works really well if you're able to do that. If not, kind of just going through the basics of who your target audience is or demographics or psychographics, um, inputting that in a systematic way is really helpful in steering your plan to a really solid result. Then moving on, it's really important to also outline your marketing goals. You can really steer the model in the right direction here by being clear upfront about what you're looking for. If it's lead generation, increase in sales, um, you're just looking for some strategy recommendations, um, brand awareness. So it's really helpful to outline these goals clearly and right up front. Um, highly recommend doing that um, right off the bat. And then another thing that people often forget about is you can re request specific elements. So if there's something that you really want to be included in your marketing plan or your marketing plan outline from ChatGPT, make sure that you ask for it, um, whether it's competitive landscape or spot analysis or specific marketing channels like social media strategy or email marketing strategy, make sure that you request those specific elements um, and that'll help to give a more holistic outline when you're actually prompting ChatGPT for these outputs. And then the last thing I would recommend would be encouraging creativity. This is something that we don't often think about when we're prompting and we're, when we're using ChatGPT. It's not something that's top of my mind, but it really helps to encourage the model to think beyond the norm. And it's kind of weird to say that the model's thinking, but it is able to generate more innovative and more creative responses when you specifically prompt it to do so. So I really encourage using the phrases like suggest innovative ideas or explore new trends in your prompts. And those can be great follow-up prompts, um, which I'll kind of talk about next. Um, Using layered prompting, if we move to the next slide, the best one of the best practices that I recommend is to not try and or to wrap your head around the fact that you're not going to get everything you need in one prompt. So putting in one prompt and expecting the output to be perfect and ideal is just not the case. Um, building and refining your prompts is really where the magic happens. Um, and that's what layered prompting is. So starting off with Maybe you create a really compelling prompt for your marketing plan outline, and then you want to use another follow-up prompt to build upon that and layer upon your initial prompt. Um, and then the next thing that I would recommend is to always balance your AI-driven insights with human intuition. So the models are not perfect. They're not to be trusted in terms of factual reality. They can make stuff up. So it's really important to integrate your own ideas and your own intuition into your prompts and not to take the outputs from chat GPT as universal law, because there's a lot that is not to be trusted. Um, and as Raina kind of touched on before, never use sensitive information in your prompts. Um, this can kind of be defined by your organization but anything that would be considered sensitive, I would avoid um, avoid using. There have been cases um, where someone was able to hack into ChatGPT and actually uncover people's prompts and be able to see exactly what you're inputting into ChatGPT. So just be very careful with what you're putting in in terms of sensitive information um, and keep that in mind with everything that you do. Um, next, I just want to go through a couple example prompts of prompts that I would consider to be detailed or sorry, would concise and clear and generate a detailed output um, for exactly what we're looking for here as marketers. Um, 
So the example prompt here is act as a social media manager and develop concise, compelling ad copy for a new fitness app on Instagram, focusing on the benefits of easy at-home workouts to motivate signups from busy individuals. So this touches on kind of every aspect I talked about before, goals, target market, um, and that kind of main, the main points are all kind of addressed in this example prompt here and while still being clear and concise. But moving on, I think it's important that we think about, okay, what could be our follow-up prompts to this example prompt? Um, we can't expect it to write a full marketing plan off of one prompt without giving it kind of our own proprietary information or more information about what we're doing on our app. What style are we looking, looking to emulate? So following up our kind of initial outline prompts with more specific prompts, such as, can you rewrite the headline to be more encouraging and welcoming? I like the call to action you came up with. Can you write me five more innovative call to action ideas? So just thinking about ways we can build upon our initial prompts and build upon the outputs that we're receiving are really helpful. Um, the next example, act as a marketing expert. So we're using the act as hack here and create a detailed marketing plan for a new organic food product launch targeting health conscious consumers including market analysis, target audience profiling, marketing channels, budget allocation, and success metrics. So this is a bit of a longer prompt, but it does kind of check all of our boxes. And we are calling out specific areas that we want included in this um, marketing plan outline, which I find to be super helpful. Moving on to some follow-ups here. The prompt that I gave would not give you necessarily a comprehensive plan overview. Sometimes it can kind of pull from your suggestions more than other things. So a good follow-up here would be, okay, what other areas should be included in this plan to make it more comprehensive? Or can you act as a creative writer and generate five marketing campaign themes targeted towards health conscious consumers? So these are examples of kind of layered prompting as we build upon our initial idea and as we get more information from ChatGPT about what it wants and what it needs, these are good examples of how we can follow up and engage more deeply with ChatGPT to create better results. Um, and I'm not sure how many of you guys are ChatGPT Plus subscribers, but I went ahead and created a prompt advisor tool, which in the latest version of ChatGPT, GPT-4, there are things called GPTs, which are basically custom trained models and versions of ChatGPT. So you can go in and train a model on pretty much anything you can think of. Now, I've trained this specific model to be a prompt advisor and to answer questions about your prompts or to help you create the best prompt possible for what you're looking for. So we're going to share this link with you guys. And unfortunately, right now it's limited to ChatGPT Plus users. But we've been using this internally and find it really helpful and fun to really up our prompting game in an easy way. Um, so we're really happy to share this tool with you and hope you guys use it because it does learn based off what we input into it and it will continue to get better and better as we all use it. Um, so I highly encourage use of this tool and I hope it's helpful in your prompting journeys. With all that said, Sean is going to take us through a more advanced version of how you can utilize the ChatGPT um, API into more advanced applications. Thanks, Jake. So this, um, this project kind of started out as uh, an idea I had to use AI to create um, a, a recipe generator for one of our clients, which is Main Spirits. Um, so at IBEC, we all get one day a month um, as a personal development day and where we can spend the day exploring a new technology or learning a new skill. And so I decided to kind of bring this idea to life and, and create a prototype. Um, and from there, our designer, Matt, put together this beautiful design for it, which incorporates a lot of um, AI generated imagery as well. Um, but essentially what this is, is a very simple form the user fills out with two inputs. Um, they choose a spirit and they choose a flavor profile. And that information is then um, fed into a prompt, which is sent off to chat GPT through the API. Um, and that in turn brings back um, a, just a text of a recipe, which we then pass back to Dolly, which is the, the open AI um, image generation API. And that creates an image for the cocktail based on um, 
the prompt from the user and um, and the recipe itself. So um, let's see. So go, going into the text prompt a little bit more, um, it uses a lot of the techniques that Jake has just talked about. Um, you can see this is a couple example recipes that were generated. Um, we initially launched this around Halloween um, with the idea that we would it would work as a pop-up and we would bring it back to um, promote certain events or holidays. Um, and there's actually a winter winter holiday edition of this that will be launching tomorrow on mainspirits.com and in, in the Main Spirits app. So you can check it out um, tomorrow and try making your own uh, cocktail recipes. Um, so diving into the recipe prompt, um, first of all, we use the act as hack that Jake talked about and we, we instruct chat GPT to act as a professional bartender or mixologist. Um, and this just kind of helps keep um, the response on the rails and um, keeps the recipes realistic, kind of avoids any quirkiness or made up ingredients. Um, OpenAI and ChatGPT has pretty good filtering already. Um, so you're not gonna get any, any kind of not safe for work results that you wouldn't want associated with your brand. Um, and also limiting the input to pre-selected spirits and flavor profiles really helps um, keep the results um, safe um, to show on mainspirits.com. Um, you know, giving someone free reign to type in whatever ingredient they want could lead to some unexpected results. Um, so we also specify in the prompt that we want a, a winter holiday themed cocktail. So that keeps it on the theme for the event that, or holiday that we're promoting. Um, it, it plugs in the spirit and the flavor profile that was chosen by the user. So those are the only two pieces of the prompt that will ever change based on what is selected. Um, and then another really important piece of the prompt is to provide it with an example recipe. And in order to get this um, ready to just display on a, on a web page as soon as it's returned, um, we use a little hack here to um, to trick chat GPT into returning um, HTML markup in its response. Um, when you're normally when you're using chat GPT, whether in the browser or making a call to the API, you're essentially just going to get a big chunk of text back, um, which can make it difficult on the programming side to kind of parse out what it, you know, what is the ingredient title, what is the ingredient list, where are the directions. So by providing this example, and you can see in the screenshot. It's got um, HTML markup around each of the elements of the recipe. So this um, um, chat GPT is just smart enough to know that it should return um, it should return the recipe wrapped in this markup. And that just makes it really easy to just display right on the web page. Um, moving on from there, um, we take um, the spirit and the flavor profile chosen by the user and the um, the glass type of glassware and garnish that was returned by chat GPT and pass that off to Dolly to create an image for it. So the image that we get back will match um, the spirit and profile chosen by the user plus the um, garnish and the um, glassware chosen by chat GPT. And we also specify that it should be a winter holiday themed cocktail. So that the image kind of matches the theme that we're going with. Um, we specify that it should be on a white background and include holiday decorations. So it kind of fits in with the, the design of the page. And um, pass in the glassware and, and the garnish that was specified. And this just kind of increases the fidelity of the image and make sure it matches the recipe. So you're getting, um, you're not getting some wild image that doesn't necessarily match with the recipe that was returned as well. Um, there's some examples. These are from when we ran it for Halloween. These were all generated on the, on the web by by different users. Um, you can see it comes up with some pretty creative imagery. Um, it's using Dolly three, which is um, the the last iteration of the image generation. Dolly four is the newest one, but it's not yet available on the API. So the images are a little bit lower fidelity than what they could be in the future. Um, and then from here, this is these are some examples from the upcoming um, winter holiday themed version. And I left one in here to kind of show, to kind of highlight some of the uh, pit potential pitfalls, especially with image generation. The second one here, the Nightmare Before Christmas Margarita, um, Chat GPT wanted it garnished with an orange wheel, and Dolly literally made an orange wagon wheel instead of a slice of citrus. So just a, 
no matter how how well you engineer your prompt, especially with images, you can always get unexpected results. But sometimes it's usually pretty funny. Thank you, Sean. So I think one of the important parts about that example that Sean shared is that it all right, relates back to our AI principles that we started with. This chat, the Cocktail Bot 5000 is not a replacement of a human. We still work with bartenders and influencers. This is in addition to the human work that we're already doing. We also have been very collaborative with our client the whole time. So they've been a stakeholder in the process. Sean has been partnering with Matt Smith, who's our lead designer to um, you know, peer review all the work that he's doing. And we're also being transparent with the consumers. They know that they're typing in recipe prompts to a robot, not to a human. And we've had fun with it and experimented and, and tried new things. And that's really what it's all about is finding that balance between what is a practical marketing tool, marketing initiative for your business, and how can you use it to bring joy to humans and make all of our human lives more efficient and fun. So with that said, thank you again, Sean, Jake, and Raina for sharing your recommendations on AI. We'd love to open up the the floor to questions. Um, I can unmute you or you can um, request to be unmuted in the chat channel and we'll be happy to answer answer any questions you have. Just to kick it off, Becky, uh, we had a couple of questions about receiving the recording and possibly receiving slides after the presentation. Um, can you explain how we're gonna be following up with everyone? Yes, so after the presentation today, we'll, um, we have been recording this Zoom meeting, so we will share that with you as well as a copy of the slide deck, and that will include a link to Jake's GPT that you need, that you can test out if you have GPT-4. Awesome. Well, it seems like we might have answered everybody's questions right in the presentation. <laughs> We've got a question from Dave. Let me find you and unmute you on the speakers. Thanks. Um, Dave McConnell, everybody, good presentation. The um, the concern that I, I have when I work, I've played around a little bit with um, chat GPT and with the Google equivalent Bard is the um, whole factual hallucination part of the thing. Um, and I'm wondering if any of the panelists or anybody else has tips on like, other than be aware that this happens, that it will lie to you <laughs> or make stuff up. Like, how do you, you know, how do you, what do you do to sort of counteract that or to screen to, to deal with that issue? So from a coding perspective, um, usually um, I do a quick read through. We also are using a, a, um, a tool to help us write code assistively. Um, Usually I can read through um, the content there and just sort of make the make it run and see if it actually does what I'm expecting it to. Um, I would say for fact checking content, probably pulling out examples of what it has returned to you. It, it's hard to give a generalized, you know, reply without knowing exactly, you know, what the what the case is. Um, I would say. Definitely, if it's returning facts for you to use, do a Google search and make sure that that, you know, is supported. Don't rely on it for, for factual based information. Jake, do you have anything about um, like prompt engineering with regards to that? Yeah, I mean, I'd be curious the specific application, Dave, that you're using it for. Um, it does have a very encyclopedic knowledge, but it doesn't always use that to the best of its ability. So I guess just going back to the tips I gave before about being concise and clear and kind of being goal oriented, that does help cut down on 
kind of outlier responses or the model making stuff up. Um, yeah, just being like very intentional with your prompts and not asking open-ended questions or not using it as a Google search tool, using it more as like a idea generation and kind of creative brainstorming tool. I've found better results there. I would refrain from asking it specific historical questions or specific fact-based questions. Um, it tends to not perform as well there, but from a creative writing and kind of idea generation standpoint, that's where I see it really kind of excelling and propelling ideas forward. Um, yeah, I, I think you can think of it, um, you know, when it when it's called a language model, um, it's meant to be conversational in nature. So you can treat it with a similar level of, of trustworthiness as just any person you meet on the street or at a party. Um, you know, before you go just saying the same thing that someone you happen to run into at the store told you, um, you know, definitely double check that. I, I would apply a similar level of scrutiny there. Yeah, that's helpful. Thanks. Mm -hmm. There's also a couple other tips that I would mention now. Um, ask, asking the model to take its time has actually, there's a study happening right now where people are showing that if you actually ask the model to slow down and take time, it actually produces better results. So thinking about utilizing that um, is an interesting approach. It's not necessarily a proven thing right now, but it is something to consider using um, in 2024 is going to be a new landscape as well <laughs> as the models continue to get better and better right now. This is the worst it's ever going to be. So keep that in mind as well. <laughs> it will likely get better with factual information too. And it looks like, um, and, oh, sorry, go oh, go ahead, Sean. I think we're going to say the same thing. Yeah. I was just going to say, it looks like Ben uh, Kramer suggested in the chat that you can ask it to cite the, um, the sources for facts that it's returning. Which hopefully will will be a real source and not another hallucination. Yeah, I mean, I have I I did try that once and it cited a fake um, like news article, which was <laughs> it just kind of keeps digging itself deeper, I guess. Sometimes. Yeah, I mean that's that's part of it as well because you know if it starts if AI starts getting trained on other AI generated content you know, that kind of wraps back onto what are the sources that we're talking about? Um, what is it being trained on? If it's trained on hallucinations, it's just, it's just going to get worse. <laughs> um, we had Aiden in chat ask, um, I've noticed a lot of my responses seem to have a small vocabulary. For example, I will get dynamic um, a lot as an adjective, even after instructing it to use different words. What advice do you have to help it use other words? Yeah, the first piece would probably be to use the act as hack. If you're not using it, I encourage it to act as a literary expert or a creative writer that has worked for me in the past. Um, I haven't run into this specific issue, but you can also encourage the use of specific words, um, input some words that you think are better examples than dynamic and maybe encourage it to use thesaurus. <laughs> um, it can actually pull from that. So those would be my tips for that. And using the act as hack will hopefully address that, but. With, uh, we've had some experimentation specifically with chat GPT-4 um, where we can upload content and have it learn from that content. So if you have examples of your writing that you're comfortable uploading into the system to use as um, something that it trains itself off of, um, that might help incorporate a more familiar vocabulary into it as well. Another thing I would add would be if you're not, or if you haven't used the current version, ChatGPT4, I highly recommend to spend the 20 bucks, try it for a month and use the most advanced model that's out there. Cause that in itself, just the, the transition from 3.5 to four, it's been trained on a lot more data, more relevant data, more recent data. And I highly recommend trying that out before making any assumptions about the technology. Other questions or comments?
All right. Well, thanks for all of the kind words in chat. We're so helpful that this was valuable to you. And if you have any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. We will be in touch this afternoon with a copy of the presentation and the recording and more links for you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Bye. Thank you.